it's completely coincidence, but the next speaker is a very special one to me because he's the one that introduced me to OpenStreetMap and to coding. Um, I did a traineeship at the European Cyclist Federation with Alexander Buczynski, and we worked together on an acronym, KESIO, that I never want you to forget after this talk, quantifying Europe's cycling infrastructure using OpenStreetMap, okay? So the next talk will be about cycling infrastructure in Europe. Alexander Buczynski, please give a big applause. <laughs> Hello, good morning. I'm Alexander or Oleg. Um, I'm from the European Cyclist Federation, and uh, yeah, I will be mostly to allege the grid presenting work done by Eleanor, who left us uh, a year and a bit ago. Uh, my main job, I'm, I'm not a coder, I'm not a cartographer, my, I'm a policy officer. My main job is to go to the European institutions and convince them to provide better legislation for uh, development of cycling across Europe. So, for example, provide uh, more funding for cycling infrastructure. Uh, but for that, it's quite useful to have some numbers, uh, like what, uh, how much uh, cycle tracks do we have uh, currently, how much do we need, what, uh, how many have we developed in the last year, and so on and so on. And the problem is that uh, cycling infrastructure traditionally be, has been uh, a municipal co uh, competence. So also all the uh, mapping statistics was done on on the uh, on the on the municipal level, and uh, when you get some data, it's usually not uh, comparable. Even sometimes with the uh, with the other municipalities in the in the same country, it all comes in different uh, shapes and sizes and uh, different different uh, uh, scopes. Or at the same time, we have all the different kinds of researchers and policy makers, and also me desperate for, for uh, some data. What actually, well, we have been looking at OpenStreetMap for a long time. What actually triggered that into some action was the sustainable and smart mobility strategy adopted a few years by the European Commission. Uh, when they said that over the, they said the aspiration for Europe to develop uh, 10, uh, 5,000, sorry, 5,000 kilometers of safe bike lanes. So we looked at this number. Wait, wait a moment. Like 5,000 kilometers, that would be a nice aspiration, for example, for the agglomeration of Helsinki. Uh, that's Helsinki is big city, but Europe or just the EU is a bit bigger. So we really need to get... Uh, better numbers in this, in this kind of communication. Uh, so we came up with uh, our dashboard where we use OpenStreetMap to, to, to count how much is there actually. The second version of the dashboard that has been released this year includes uh, 37 countries, so it's a bit wider than the EU. And uh, we provide the statistics on the level of uh, so-called nuts free uh, so it's the nomenclature of units for territorial statistics. It's uh, something that's used for Eurostat. It makes it possible to correlate or to to to, uh, to add some, uh, to combine this uh, with other data sets that are provided by uh, Eurostat. And you can see that uh, we came to a much higher number than this 5,000 that was the aspiration for uh, 2030. Uh, so I want to talk a bit about how do we extract the cycle network, what do we do with this data, and finally what uh, we have problems with, which maybe you can help me uh, with. Uh, first, the uh, process, the pipeline, and again, feel free to tell me if uh, there is something wrong with that. Uh, once every few months, we get the PBFs from Geofabric. Uh, we use the Osmium uh, package to uh, extract uh, all highways from that. Uh, then we cut it into the, the, the nuts free uh, small regions. Uh, we extract the uh, cycle infrastructure and we extract the public road network, which we divide into main roads and local roads. And then we produce some array for each of those uh, uh, nuts free. So this is an example of uh, nuts uh, on the, on, the, on the right side of the slide, you see nuts free for uh, arrondissement uh, Antwerpen. 
And these are the kinds of uh, cycle infrastructure that we consider. Uh, we uh, look for cycle tracks dedicated, uh, segregated physically from uh, motor vehicles tracks, cycle and pedestrian tracks, which is the same, but also shared with pedestrians. Uh, cycle lanes, which is still some dedicated spa for space for cyclists, but uh, just uh, separated by a strip of paint. Uh, bus and cycle lanes. Uh, cycle streets, which uh, are streets which can be used by motor vehicles or some kinds of motor vehicles, but cycling is somehow prioritized. It depends on the country, what does it mean exactly? And uh, something we added recently is limited access roads, but the name probably is not the best one, but it's generally all the uh, roads where you have some motorized vehicle traffic, for example, agricultural vehicles or the residents of the area. Uh, so those are not uh, cycle tracks in the traditional sense, but uh, they are still an important part of uh, cycle networks, especially in rural areas. Uh, so, probably most of you are aware of that, but the bit of complication with cycling infrastructure is that it can be uh, represented in OpenStreetMap in two uh, different ways. Uh, one is as an independent feature, like in this case. Uh, in this case, uh, we uh, decided that this is a cycle and pedestrian track on basis of uh, four parameters. So first, it's, uh, it's a path. Then we check that it's designated for bicycles and for uh, pedestrians. And then there is no segregation between those two groups of users. So it's, uh, it's combined cycle and pedestrian path. We also decided that it's two-way because uh, one way is set to no. But also if there was, in this case, also if this was not set, then also it would be considered two-way. And we also take note of uh, some additional parameters. We don't really do anything much uh, with them at this moment, but we trace how uh, how many of those uh, features have those set in case we reach some critical mass, we uh, we want to use them like surface smoothness or, or width. Uh, this is the other case uh, where the cycle tracks are just additional attributes for, uh, for a highway. This is most primarily for cars. And in this case, we convert one uh, feature from OpenStreetMap into two features in our cycle network representation uh, because this uh, cycleway both is used. It could be also cycleway left, cycleway right. And uh, also this feature has marked uh, surface that it's, uh, it's set, but we don't uh, use it because uh, that's something I will come back to bit later if I still have time, but generally the, the, the extra elements of the road, they don't, uh, we think they don't inherit the, the, the parameters of the, of the, of the main uh, feature. So that's a colorful graph that sort of uh, tries to explain what uh, what kind of subsets we extract from this subset of highways that we extract from OpenStreetMap. Uh, there is this big chunk of cycle infrastructure, but we are also interested in the network of public roads, which we divide into main roads, local roads. I will come back to this in a moment. And then within local roads, uh, we pay special attention to one-way local uh, roads and whether uh, contraflow cycling or, or cycling in both directions allowed on them. And there is uh, also this uh, big uh, uh, area of uh, road tracks that are not accessible for bicycles, bridleway, hiking trails, which are not uh, used for further processing. So we extracted those networks. What do we do with that? Uh, the first and most uh, so far fruitful attempt was to take the three main types of uh, really segregated cycling infrastructure, cycle tracks and cycle and pedestrian tracks and uh, cycle lanes, and uh, co compare this with the main road network. So basically when we divided this uh, uh, public road network into main and ro roads and local roads, uh, we made an assumption that on main roads, there is more uh, car traffic 
and the car traffic is faster. So uh, these are the roads where cyclists would need a separate infrastructure. And on local roads, uh, they would uh, be more or less safe cycling together with motor vehicles. Uh, so this is the, the ratio that uh, we've tested that best correlates with, uh, uh, with uh, actual level of safety in those countries and also the, the popularity of cycling in different countries. It's not 100% cor correlation, but it's about 70-80%. So we're quite happy with this first uh, estimation. Uh, this was already in the, the first edition that Eleanor worked on, and we've received a lot of comments that we should include that, include uh, uh, something else. Uh, so we've done some experiments. We tried to put all the, uh, all, the, um, all the different types of infrastructure together, also compare uh, to see whether the local roads are suitable. It's also interesting to see the results, but it's not... Uh, it's not uh, improving the, the, any of the correlations that we're really interested in. And of course, you, I said we, uh, we go on the NATS uh, three level. So for each country, you can go into a more detailed map and get these uh, statistics for uh, specific, uh, specific small regions. That's the availability of additional data. And that's, uh, that's the one map where the colors are a bit different, I think. It's mostly the countries where uh, we started to add cycling infrastructure later that, uh, that have more uh, additional data. And something that is uh, particularly interesting, or was interesting for me, uh, is uh, the, uh, the, how widespread is contraflow uh, cycling. So this uh, enabling, enabling cycling on uh, one-way roads and we can generate a few uh, more maps that uh, are interesting from mm, this point of view. So what we used it this for already with the first approach when we heard about this 5,000 kilometers, uh, there was, this is um, about 20 urban nodes. It's because an, of an ongoing discussion about uh, an European regulation which sets out uh, so 400 something uh, main cities uh, which uh, are supposed to develop a bit more of sustainable uh, mobility. And uh, we looked uh, by comparing this cycling, the existing cycling infrastructure to the main not the network, how much is there still missing? So we looked at how much is there missing in different countries, or uh, you can also express it in, in, a, in a percentage. And uh, it has been successful to, to at some point, we, when we summed up these uh, this needs in the urban nodes of the, of the, of the uh, EU network, uh, we said that we need about 100,000 uh, more of dedicated uh, segregated cycle infrastructure. Uh, we didn't get that much, but uh, at least uh, the, the current plans are to support uh, not five, but not, not from, we moved from having a goal of 5,000 5, kilometer uh, we moved to the, the EU support for 12,000 uh, extra kilometers comparing, uh, comparing to what we uh, have now. So what do we have uh, problems with? Well, the first and the big question is this division between main roads and local roads. So this is a big question for us on the European big scale uh, uh, evaluation, but also for any uh, route planner, uh, you, you have this question, is it, uh, you don't have everywhere segregated cycle infrastructure. You will use probably 50, 70% of your trip uh, streets or roads which you share for cars. And, the question is, is, it, uh, is this segment of a street safe to cycle in mixed traffic without segregated infrastructure? And uh, the best bet we still have at this moment is the highway attributes, which defines the sort of class or category of the road. And we made an assumption that uh, basically this is a bit over, uh, over safe, but we uh, took everything up to the tertiary level as uh, in this main road network. 
and on the living uh, residential and classified and living streets in the uh, in the in the local street network. But this is not uh, really perfect, and. Uh, the, the same category of the road, even, even within the same country, can describe really different uh, roads. So these, these are both secondary roads in, in France, maybe 200 kilometers apart. The one on the left is perfectly fine and comfortable for cycling. The one on the right is the one that uh, uh, the cyclists escape from and use this cliffside uh, path behind the, the barrier because the, it's too scary to cycle on the road. And there's basically nothing on in the OSM tags that would tell you that the, 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 the road on the right is worse. Uh, on contrary, you will have more tags that say you that, for example, the, on the road on the right, you cannot drive uh, with trucks. Uh, you can, there is a speed limit. So if you just do automatic processing, it will uh, direct you to this road uh, to, on the right as more uh, preferable. And of course, it also can be in the other side, uh, the unclassified roads, which theoretically should be the lowest category of the road. They can sometimes get really busy and unpleasant. So what we do outside OpenStreetMap uh, for our Eurovelo routes, which uh, my colleague Florence will be talking about tomorrow, uh, we ask so-called route inspectors to count cars for a few minutes and uh, compare how much uh, it, you, you put, we have an app where you, for example, put that you uh, encountered 25 cars in 10 minutes and there is a very rough estimation that it should be around 2,000 cars per day. Maybe it's 4,000, maybe it's 1,000, but you get an idea about the, 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 the possible uh, range. And this is also something that uh, our members in Germany, I see, uh, or Denmark are doing. Uh, what our uh, UK coordinator is doing, they just bought commercial, uh, commercial data about traffic because they found that it's not really uh, it would be too much work or it's not reliable. Uh, there is also a, a startup in Portugal that tries to uh, guess the, how safe the road is basing on Google Street View images by processing them automatically. Uh, none of those approaches is perfect, so if you know any open data set that could complement OSM this aspect, that would be fantastic. Okay, and the quality of cycle infrastructure is something that we would really like to get into because you can have a cycle track, but then there's the question whether it's really useful for anything. And uh, some, something is directly in OpenStreetMap tags. Uh, something could be probably inferred from uh, either the GPS track or the uh, digital elevation model or something else maybe. Uh, what we found that in the countries where cycling is very is still not very popular, uh, we quite often you can find uh, mountain bike or sporting sport routes uh, marked as uh, cycling dedicated infrastructure. Uh, and uh, yeah, there is a problem with uh, if you have one feature. Uh, uh, representing different objects, uh, for example, uh, for example, a highway and a cycle track next to it, or in this case, this is a cycle track and a pedestrian track next to each other. Uh, you can find that different taggers, different maybe different tagging apps, interpreted differently. Whether, for example, width applies to to just one element or to both of them. And uh, I probably my time is going out. I wanted to ask you questions, but maybe it's time for, it's your turn for questions. Okay, everyone. Thank you very much, Alexander Puczynski again for this very interesting talk. And now we have some time for questions and I already see one hand in the back there, so I'm going to throw the mic to you, sir. Uh, 
Almost. Nice. Go ahead. When quantifying uh, the cycleway infrastructure, did you... Is the mic? It's a mic, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, when quantifying uh, the cycleway infrastructure, did you uh, consider distinguishing between missing cycleways and cycleways that have not been mapped yet? Or where it's not clear if there will if there is one or not. So specifically, cycleway equals no versus there's simply no tag. Because you know, OpenStreetMap data is not complete. I think it, from what I've seen in OpenStreetMap, it's much safer to assume that. Uh, uh, People don't explicitly tag a cycleway is no for most of the roads. But I, I, I don't have the number on the top of my head. Probably someone can run it in, in 15 seconds and uh, check for how many roads is cycle is, is a cycleway no set. In 30 zones. Uh, uh, it's very, I think it's very unlikely that there will be a cycleway, but other roads maybe. Anyway. Um. Him because it seems to be related. Um, we work for Gervelo, so it's a French mapping um, company, and we try to map all the cycleways in France uh, in the partners' areas. And we've seen in your posters outside that um, the French areas that are um, really well mapped are the, the best uh, areas in your, in your data. So it's very related. If you map the data, if you map the cycleways, uh, the country will, will be better. So I think there is a lot of, um, of data that are missing around Europe and that all the countries can't be seen on the same map because there is a lot of um, mapping difference. Well, that's what's interesting for us, the European level, not, uh, not doing a detail detailed analysis of one city. It also has been done by other people many times, but trying to get the bigger picture uh, on, on the European scale. And uh, I agree that there is always uh, something missing. And if you do a really systematic mapping, you will find something, but also Maybe a hypothesis from my side would be that uh, maybe the uh, municipalities, uh, the regions that pay you for uh, mapping their cycle paths, there are the ones that already have been developing them for longer time. So it could also be that it could be a correlation, but not causation. Uh, hi. Uh, I saw on the PowerPoint that you uh, considered it bicycle infrastructure if uh, a path or a road was tagged as bicycle designated, but how did you treat bicycle yes? Was it also infrastructure or not? It depends on what's the parent. Generally, uh, we take, we put it as a part of the cycle network. If you, for example, have a footway uh, that has bicycle, yes. Uh, we consider it a sidewalk with uh, uh, cycling allowed. We put it in the cycle network or uh, internal image of cycle network, but we don't count it in the, in the uh, length of kilometers because this category includes a lot of, uh, really a lot, lot, lot of, uh, of uh, paths, alleys in parks that are not really relevant for, for, for uh, cycle network. Uh, hello. Uh, a popular discussion now with, uh, in the cities and the villages is about the width of the cycle paths. Do you have, do you provide statistics about that also for the European community? Mm. I mean, we could generate the statistics, but it would be based on maybe 20% of the infrastructure because that's maybe the rate that uh, wheat is marked now. 
And uh, we have doubts about quality of this data because there is no, we saw examples where you, where you, where it's applies like in this, the, the case with uh, common cycle tracks, uh, it doesn't apply to specifically cycle infrastructure, but to some wider object. Can, can you move to the slide with link to data uh, uh, with the statistics? Uh, because I uh, tried this at cfe.com website and I cannot find this. Uh, oh, okay, thanks. And it's in the carousel that is on top of the website, so you can find it also from ecf.com. Kind of second, uh, I want to advertise Street Complete if someone wants to add part of the missing data. Big applause to Oleg Buczynski, please. Thank you. <laughs> and to me. <laughs> no, but also actually to OSM Belgium, because when I started working at ECF, uh, that's when we made the link with OpenStreetMap, and they have been so accessible and amazing and have been helping us, but we still need, well, you, me indirectly, we still need your help um, to make it better and better and better. So thank you. <laughs>